the beauty of music is it's scattered throughout both hemispheres and each hemisphere will do specific jobs, but the whole brain is involved. So when children are exposed to music or the creation of music or, or any kind of plane of music it helps develop a whole brain. One of the things that I find comes up a lot in my own teaching and rehearsing and thinking about it is the question of rhythm. Mm -hmm. And when I've tried to sort of get into the reading about the brain and rhythm in particular, I've sort of found myself in uh, reading about therapies for movement disorders like Parkinson's and things like that. But I wonder how much we know about timing and rhythm in the brain. My sense is that there's still a lot we don't know, but I wonder what you what you could tell me. <laughs> <laughs> so if you think about about a beat. A beat mm -hmm. is something that happens in the present moment. And then if you attach a beat with another beat, now you're suddenly creating a rhythm. And in that level of complexity then, different groups of cells are actually coming online and being involved in kind of this orchestra inside of the brain as the brain cells as the different instruments of that orchestra. So I think that as I think about uh, beat or rhythm, in pattern response, it goes back to the wavelength and the way that the brain cells actually coordinate and communicate with one another. And so when you think about how different rhythms impact the brain, whether it's it's something that is, is just a really powerful beat or very methodical rhythm, something that is more fluid, you're going to be stimulating different groups of cells. And the brain is a very, very big place with a whole mm -hmm. bunch of cells in there. So, so as, as varied as what the beat or the rhythm could be, the pattern response will influence different groups of cells. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's one of the things that I've found in teaching is you can often help people, at least I, in my own work, to hear pitch and harmony with more precision. Mm -hmm. But to solve rhythmic difficulties is much more slippery and elusive. Of course, you can do counting things and things like that. You can solve it uh, mathematically. Mm -hmm. But sort of finding the, the coordinations mm -hmm. that really feel rhythmic right. is really difficult. Is that consistent with what we know so far? Or... I think that, that as you're looking at the brain and you're looking at a rhythm and you're looking at everything about the brain is the ability of the brain to differentiate between two things. And, and so if, if someone has absolutely no musical training, they might hear a whole bunch of different pitches and hear it just as one same thing. And with a more trained ear, then you can begin to differentiate and have more refinement in that process. So I think as you're looking at specific rhythms, you're asking that brain to differentiate between some things that to you seem very clear, but to them, they have to learn. And one of the best ways to learn is to actually train someone to do it wrong, have somebody do it wrong and then and then, or do it louder or to, to do it differently in some way so that they can actually realize, oh, what you're asking is different from what I was experiencing. But it's all about the ability of those cells to say, this is different from that, and therefore I can now use that as a tool. That's interesting. I'm, I'm wondering for the two of you, yeah, I know in my own rehearsals with groups, we do a lot of that. Mm -hmm. So we'll say this is something we do not want, and we kind of caricature it, and then right. we sort of set it. And I'm wondering if, if for the two of you who are both wonderful instrumentalists, if that is in any way a part of your practice, if doing something you wish not to do. I think so. Uh, deciding if, for instance, you're going to come at something from, I'm going to play this louder and louder until I get to the, until I go just beyond it and pair it back. Or am I going to play as loud as I can and tame it down into something? And there are the two kind of versions. Make something wilder until it's about right, or chill something out until it's about right. And uh, it's probably slightly different depending on what mood you're in and what music it is. Yeah, um, and it's something I learned from one of my first teachers, which is like find the biggest, wildest, almost out of control version and start from there, and it makes practicing exhausting, uh, but it also makes it extremely effective. It's like exercising rather than a long, slow run, a really short uh, burst of energy, um, but it's, it's so much more pointed. 
I've also really gotten into, I call it putting it under the microscope. If something is giving me trouble, I can almost always identify one physical movement that's the problem. And if you really hone in on that, uh, you can solve uh, an entire passage. And in terms of working with people that are learning a piece of mind, the crazy thing is I often find it's all about finding the right word to say to them. And sometimes it's, it could be, you know, swamp, something mm-hmm. like that. And suddenly the whole passage makes more sense. It's one of the reasons I wanted to work as much in person with the two of you as we could. Because as I was saying, you know, you, we read notation as musicians. Um, and we're supposed to be really good at that. But I find over and over again when you work with composers, it's not even it's not only the word, but it's just the tone of voice or something that the way one of you will say, this is how it goes. So I would say, sing something for me because I can feel in your inflection what your intention is. Right. It's really powerful. The ancient Greeks were some of the first to sort of put a, some logic and order into the idea of music, or at least as far as we know. But they had these ideas that different scales would excite different emotions. And even certain scales, like ordering of notes, um, were outlawed because they thought it would make people too... Warlike. Oh, too warlike, too sexually charged, something like that. Do you, is that. do you think that's just a cultural thing or is there some... Do you think it's possible there's some scientific basis that a certain aggregate of notes could mm-hmm. affect you that way? Yeah, I, I think it's demonstrated all the time in the way that certain classical pieces in particular will stimulate alpha wavelengths inside of the brain or beta, and beta is going to be much more uh, I'm alert, I'm aware, I'm going to go do something. Uh, theta waves that are kind of in that dreamy land between being alert and not alert. Uh, and then uh, delta waves where I'm pretty much on my way to sleep or you might use delta waves in order to get yourself to sleep. So so I don't think there's any question that, that and based on your level of communication and what you know about it, absolutely there's going to be tools, you have tools that will then result in very predictable brain patterns. Uh, when it comes to, to recovery, um, the vibrational sound, just simply the wavelength of sound, can uh, increase the neuroplasticity of the brain so that cells that have been traumatized, other cells that are stimulated by specific wavelengths, if you're looking at music as wavelength, then certain groups of cells will be stimulated in different ways by the different types of wavelength. And it encourages those cells then to reach out to other areas of the brain. So if you've got a group of cells that are traumatized, by definition, they're not functioning normally. And that might be because they've died, they've gone dormant, or they're just in trauma because they're in sweat, they're in an edema, they're swollen. So depending on what the trauma is, the use of sound, not just music, but sound and probably less complicated sound can can actually stimulate neuro, neuroplasticity inside of the brain.